go. All right, so um, as a college student at the end of the 1960s and uh, early 1970s, and newly introduced to classical singing, I obtained an album of Swedish tenor UC Bierling's singing Amy Beach's Ah Love But A Day. Probably some of you know this recording. Um, there were several glorious moments on that recording, but one I listened to over and over again was the second iteration of the text, Look In My Eyes, at which you see did a portamento from an E flat up to an A flat on the A ah vowel of eyes, causing his voice to turn over. The color change in Bierling's voice during that leap was such a thing of drama and beauty that I had to know how he was doing it. I listened to it over and over again, and it goes like this. I thought, what is he doing? As a young tenor, I have to figure that out. Well, it was a long time. In fact, I would say about 18 years before I had a good handle on what was going on there, that color shift. But I began studying, meanwhile, my first pedagogy text, none other than William Bernard's Singing the Mechanism and the Technique, where I first learned about voice source harmonics and vocal tract formants. Twelve years later, at the 1983 Nats Convention in Minneapolis, Tom Cleveland presented a paper on the relationship of the singer's formant frequency to vocal category or voice fog. And during that paper, uh, a synthesized tenor voice was played singing an F major scale on the vowel A. Ah. Remarkably, the tenor's vocal quality migrated through the color changes associated with successful male passaggio, though no changes in the formant tuning or the source input had been programmed other than the change of pitch. I will briefly go there momentarily. Good. See how this works. sure what that was about. <laughs> Though Passaggio was not the focus of Tom's presentation, I was struck by the notion that the timbral shifts of vocal cover were not necessarily due to laryngeal changes, rather to some resonance phenomenon not yet understood. Since that was accomplished, those color changes you heard were purely resonance interactions. So more study ensued. Six years later, in 1989, I was on a sabbatical in at Oberlin working with Richard Miller. And during the lesson with Richard, my voice turned over on the vowel A on D4. I was operating under the assumption uh, from Richard's work that, well, the tenor voice enters the zona di passaggio at about D4, the primo passaggio, and transitions and then turns over at about the secondo passaggio at G, G4. And this was D4, the primo passaggio. I said, Richard, was that, what was that? Was that okay? It sounded strange to me on the inside. He said, was what okay? I said, that what just happened? I don't know, do it again. I sang it again, he said, yeah, it's fine. And moved on, no more conversation. That was the second major epiphany in my journey and at that time I was rehearsing, Richard was just setting up his lab with the KLMetrix 5500. Actually, I set it up, not them. I'm not very technologically advanced, but Richard was even less so, curiously <laughs> enough. This brilliant, brilliant man, but just not a, a button puncher. Anyway, and so I was practicing in that lab with the KLMetrix, and I noticed after that lesson 
my vowels turn over and my voice does this closing thing in some kind of parallel relationship with first formal locations of vowels. The and I had seen that pattern in Sundberg's Science of the Singing Voice. So I'd seen that pattern of, I said, what is this? Well, uh, I was able to figure out pretty soon the approximate pitches for each of those cardinal vowels of my voice is turning, even though I didn't know exactly what the phenomenon was, what the relationships were, and it transformed my training of male passaggio and led me to more study, and it really launched me further into this acoustic journey. Um, let's see. Meanwhile, I managed to obtain the K-Elementric sonograph from my own studio in the early 90s and have been using real-time spectrography in lessons ever since. It was quite some time before I was confident enough to write about my observations. That occurred after a conversation with Swedish scientist Sten Turnström, who introduced me to Svante Granqvist's Made synthesizer, with which I could prove the specific factors involved. My observations were also confirmed later by my friend and colleague Donald Miller, who along with Harm Schutte had been documenting the same phenomena in their Groningen laboratory. I had actually approached a few other voice scientists earlier with my observations, but was unsuccessful in interesting them in exploring or testing this tenor from the backwaters of Wisconsin's hypothesis. <laughs> Donald was the first voice scientist to affirm my observations. So in 2007, uh, I finally wrote an article for Richard Miller Festschrift edition of the Vernal Journal of Singing in Scott's uh, column area entitled A Case for Voice Science in the Voice Studio, in which I stated the theme of this conference really, there is no necessary conflict between the art of teaching and the investigations of voice science. If approached with sufficient care, patience, and humility, they can be tremendous allies. This is not to say that emerging voice science always has been on the right track, nor that everything it observes is of use in the studio. That is not how science proceeds, nor is pedagogy its only or even its primary purpose. The best hope for effective collaboration lies both in increased communication and cooperation between excellent teachers and excellent scientists and those few individuals who are truly conversant in both fields. The more that teachers and scientists honestly and respectfully seek to understand each other, acknowledging the value of each other's perspective, the more progress we will make. By working together, well-designed and executed studies can be undertaken that will fulfill that which motivates both communities, our mutual love of beautiful, liberated singing. Since then, I've written a number of other articles and a couple of books on my acoustic observations. The value of these observations to studio pedagogy, uh, observations which in, are in general agreement with the work of other teachers and researchers, such as Donald Miller, Harm Schutte, Burton Coffin, Johann Sundberg, Ingo Tietze, Scott McCoy, and many others. There's a growing number of younger researchers that are doing great work. Uh, Anyway, the, the, the uh, possible value of, of these observations include the following implications. Audible acoustic registration events are primarily due to the changing relationship of the sung pitch and its harmonic set with the first format of the vocal tract. The second format is also involved in a number of these. Since first format locations vary per vowel, as my thumping of my throat showed you, so do acoustic registration events vary per vowel, rather than being at one fixed pitch, which would be the case if it were purely laryngeal. And it isn't. That doesn't deny the fact that there are major laryngeal changes, but, but these acoustic transitions occur for other reasons. Vowel quality migrates with pitch change without shape change. That means without formant retuning. Uh, I call this passive vowel modification or vowel migration. More on that a little bit later. Passive vowel modification or migration is sufficient for most pitches that lie below first formant locations. You can just let things passively modify for most pitches that lie below the first formant location. 
Active vowel modification becomes necessary for most sung pitches that lie above first formant locations. Translate everything I'm saying for a Western classical timbre. There are other styles that use other strategies, but that's my main gig. So, passive modification, passive now, you're gonna start tracking that one or it's gonna get thin really quickly. The relationship between acoustic registration events and male and female passaggi can be predictably mapped. Knowledge of all of these implications facilitates improved efficiency in training vocal range for Western classical timbre. These principles transformed my own teaching, first of non-treble male passaggi and eventually of female and treble voice passaggi. Where acoustic events occur and why is very predictable. It only requires knowledge of first formant locations and the first few intervals of the harmonic series. The primary acoustic transition of a voice Each, the primary transitions of a voice, each involve the intersection of a voice source harmonic with the first formant when they pass each other. And first formant locations are relatively easy to identify. Here's a set right there, I didn't know I'd already gotten to that. Uh, first formants are in these boxes, these IPA symbols in the boxes. Notice they're all in contact with the treble clef. These pitches down here are the pitches above which the voice would have turned over and closed and below which it would be an open tamper. The two primary acoustic events are the primary acoustic transition of the voice from open tamper, voce aperta in Italian, to closed tamper, voce chiusa, when the second harmonic from the voice source crosses above the first formant. So when you sing above these black notes, the voice is in closed position on each of those vowels. This is primarily a concern of non-treble male voices that sing mostly in the bass clef and a little bit up into the treble clef because we, we cross that all day long. The second main transition is the arrival from close timbre into what I have dubbed whoop timbre, Donald Miller calls hoot uh, tuning, which is when the sung pitch matches the first formant and you get a very heady round color. That would be if you were actually singing the pitches in these boxes. Eee, eee, eee. That's in whoop timbre. I'm tracking whoop timbre there. That's mostly relevant for treble voices that sing through the treble clef and above all day long. The passaggi of basses, baritones, and tenors are surrounded by a cluster of acoustic events, which, if honored, facilitate smooth register transition, but if violated, interfere with passaggio negotiation. Some of these secondary transitions, which occur within the bass clef, occur when you're singing pitches whose third or fourth harmonic are interacting with the first formant. Very simply, the black pitches are where the main transition from open to closed timbre happens. The red pitches are where the third harmonic is crossing over the first formant, and that is a little vowel migration transition that must be honored, or you're already singing too wide open in the passaggio. The E and the O actually are, arrive in whoop timbre, right at the top of the male passaggio. And if you don't want them to sound whoopy, you have to actually raise the first formant to avoid going into whoop timbre there. <clears throat> Knowing and allowing these necessary timbre migrations uh, facilitates efficient function across range. There's an audible degree of vowel closing whenever a source harmonic rises above the first formant. And you can learn to hear that. Understanding the cause of timbral migration has been significantly advanced through the recent psychoacoustic work of Ian Howell, sitting over here in the third row, thank you Ian, of New England Conservatory. His elaboration of the relationship between frequency, spectral tone color, and the darkness-brightness continuum, and also the relationship of harmonic spacing to timbral roughness has added much greater specificity to our understanding of human perception of sounds and of why vocal timbre migrates as it does. Here's a chart of spectral tone color. Given this more detailed mapping of the acoustic landscape that singers inhabit, the challenge that remains is continued exploration of the simplest strategies for stimulating migration across these transitions. In that regard, my second book, 
kinesthetic voice pedagogy, motivating acoustic efficiency, ventures further into singer perception of the processes involved. It revisits a, a, an intervening article also in Scott's uh, column in the journal called Remapping the Open Throat, Gola Aperta. In that chapter, I, the prefonatory tuning of the vocal tract necessary for beneficial feedback on the voice source is explored. Prefonatory tuning refers to the somewhat intuitive shaping of the vocal tract for the intended vowel and timbre prior to phonation. A variety of studio strategies are offered to counter the notoriously misleading kinesthesia of an open throat. Uh, getting this vocal tract poised right is essential to acoustic registration. In a later chapter, I explore my adaptation and application and frankly simplification of Ian's great work uh, using the, the, the useful lie or useful fiction principle. Uh, vowel perception is primarily comprised of a mixture of the vowel of the tone colors of the harmonics being featured by the first two resonances of the vocal tract, referred to as formants in most voice literature. First formant locations almost all lie in contact with the treble clef from D4 to G5. All of those frequencies, with the exception of the G5, have an O or O-like tone color. Therefore, as the lowest resonance of the voice, the first formant contributes a kind of under-vowel quality. If you think of the first formant contribution as an under-vowel quality, and the second formant as an over-vowel quality, the under-vowel is always ha highlighting harmonics that sound like ooh or oh, mostly oh, and occasionally aw, for really high uh, sopranos and an ah vowel. Therefore, uh, this is adding a warmth or a roundness or depth to the overall timbre percept. That's why the first formant is important for roundness and fullness of timbre. The second formant, lying above the treble clef, pretty much from, this is an octave higher by the way, from about that G all the way on up, lies in the spectral tone color of, it, it contributes a kind of over vowel and it spans about a musical tenth with any single voice. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this or not. Probably too quiet. It's about a tenth. Um, and it's, I'm cheating on that one a little bit, but at any rate, it covers these vowels, I, almost up to the E. So the second form, it supplies both the primary identity of those vowels to the overall timbre, as well as additional brightness. Higher is brighter, lower is darker. The singer's formant cluster lies exclusively in the top octave of the piano, which is, has a spectral tone color of hyper bright E. So singer's formant cluster is just a whole lot of E color clustered together above your two vowel formants that form the rest of the vowel. And, and we hear that all blended together into a composite vowel sound out in the world. Here's my simplified chart of this. You'll notice that the, the, even though the under vowel is actually always supplying an or and O-like quality, I think for most of us, unless we train our ears to hear those under vowel harmonics separate from the whole, we hear them as a rounded version, mixed version of the over vowel. So basically, here's the intended vowel. Notice that the intended vowel is the target vowel for all of those vowels that are identified by the second formant region. The under vowel identifies the U and the O for us. This middle line is my take on how we perceive the under vowel when we're hearing it as a, as a blend of the overall sound rather than as an isolated harmonic. Um, and you'll notice also that that middle perception, like when I do an E, if I do an E with a nice under vowel to it, if I only do the over vowel, it will sound like E. If I do it with under vowel, E, 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 E is in there. E, E, E. That's the capital Y. This under vowel percept is curiously like the active vowel modifications that many of us have used for years to adjust these vowels going higher with this difference. They're there passively. They do not require an active modification unless you're singing above the first formant. 
So for example, an a vowel in inherently includes a o quality in our perception. So if I do a and then I thump this, that doesn't sound like a, that sounds like a. If I make it sound like a, you can tell what I did. We don't do that in classical land. Okay? So our percept of the under vowel is a little bit mixed in that regard. Uh, but, but I do find, in other words, I basically agree with all the vowel modifiers throughout history that said that E vowel needs some more E in it. I just get it a different way. It's passively inherent in an open-throated setup. You don't have to E your E vowels up high. E E E Not E E Anyway. All right. Um, so, since we motivate voice to express feelings and also with a target vowel outcome in, in mind, we can learn, you can train your singers to attend to the two vowel-like colors that are comprising their composite vowel. They can actually learn to sense how they're doing that and then they can play with the percentages to achieve maximal effect. This is working very well in, in my experimentation with it. In sum, awareness of the acoustic landscape that singers inhabit, where acoustic registration events occur and why, how vowels migrate, and the specificity that spectral tone color adds to that awareness are promising developments in the applied acoustic pedagogy portion of the discipline of voice pedagogy. Thank you very much.